My name is Neil Batori. I'm following up on my last video segment about the Bayesian optimal threshold, and I'm going to talk about the Bayesian optimal threshold for the Gaussian case. If you recall, we ended up with this ratio of the conditional probabilities of x given h1 and x given h0 on one side, a less than sign, and a ratio of probabilities on the right-hand side. And if this was true, then we we're going to decide h0, and if it wasn't, we we're going to decide h1. This, as I said, is some function of x on one side and a constant on the other. And what we can do with any arbitrary probability density function for x given h1 and any conditional probability density function for x given h0 is we can write this function, and then we can work on inverting that function and doing something like this, although I know that um, I have an inequality there, so I have to be very careful about what I do when I take an inverse, if it's a one-to-one -one function or not. But that's the kind of thing that we want to do. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do this for the Gaussian case. And the benefit will be that once I just have some number over here, some constant, then I have that uh, threshold that I need in order to run my detector, and I don't need to calculate it again and again. I don't need to figure out for every value of x, plug it into some function, and then check whether it's less than a constant. I can just check whether x is less than a constant. So I'm going to do this for the Gaussian case. And when I say that w is Gaussian, that means that my conditional probability density function for x given h0 is the Gaussian distribution. So the conditional probability density function of x given h1 is equal to the Gaussian bell-shaped curve, and I'm going to get an a1 here as the mean of x. Both of these functions then go in this, this fraction, and I'm going to have to work that out. You can see that the fractions here, the constants out front, cancel out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. Because remember, the natural log is an increasing function of x. I can apply it to both sides. That's legal for working on an inequality. When I take the log of the left-hand side, I'm going to be left with the natural log and the exponential canceling out, leaving me what's inside the parentheses. And on bottom, it's going to be an additive term. I'm going to cancel out this plus because it's on the denominator, and I'm taking the natural log of something on the denominator. And I'm going to multiply out the two sigma squareds to both sides, and then work out the quadratics that are here. We're going to have these x squared terms cancel, which is great because then I've got an x term and an a term, a constant term, that I'll move over to the other side. And finally, I've got, I've divided both sides by a1 minus a0, and I've canceled out a 2 in front of the sigma squared. And I can factor out this a1 squared minus a0 squared, and um, I can factor that out as a1 minus a0 quantity multiplied by the quantity a1 plus a0, and the a1 minus a0 will cancel what's in the denominator. So then I'll be left with this expression. So this is our first formula, our most general expression. And this says that in the Gaussian case, when I have a0 and a1 that are my symbol amplitudes that are possible to be sent, what I can do is I can work on the threshold first as halfway in between them. This number is halfway between the symbols. This term is going to tell us what we want to add to that threshold. And what we're going to do is we're going to have this term that depends both on the probabilities and the a1 and a0 and the sigma squared on how to adjust our threshold for the case when h0 and h1 are not equal. Okay, because when p of h0 is equal to p of h1, that is, our symbols are equally likely, that log term is going to be the log of 1. So when we have equally likely symbols, 
this is our second expression, our threshold test becomes this one, that x is just being compared with a threshold of halfway in between the two symbols. But when our probabilities are not the same, that influences which way the threshold goes. If probability of h0 is higher than probability of h1, that is, the symbol 0 is more likely, then this log of the fraction becomes positive. This term is positive, because as long as I assume that symbol 1 has a higher voltage than symbol 0, then this term is positive, this term is positive. We're going to send the threshold closer to symbol 1. And that makes sense because if I have this case where symbol zero is much more likely, the point at which these two cross, and thus I would need the threshold, would move more and more in this direction as the probability of H zero goes up because this line is increasing and this line is decreasing. That crossing point is going to move to the right, and that's what's happening in this expression. When I say that I have two expressions, I'm really only talking about the Gaussian case I also have a third expression that comes from this equation. If I have any arbitrary probability density function for x given h1 and h0, I can plug that into this formula, work on this inequality to get to a point where I'm talking about x being less than or greater than a particular threshold. So that's all I have in this segment. And what I have here then are really three expressions for the Bayes threshold in different types of noise.